Good morning. Good morning. Um, I need to let you know there is a misprint in the in the bulletin this morning about the scripture reading, uh, where it says Acts. I'm going to be reading from Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter eight, first to twelfth verses. So if you're reading along, that's on page 941 of the Pew Bible. So chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, beginning at the first verse. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For, as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means, and even beyond their means, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints. And this not merely as we expected, they gave themselves first to the Lord and by the will of God to us, so that we might urge Titus that as he had already made a beginning, so he should also complete this generous undertaking among you. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something, now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, the scripture has already been read today, so let us pray as we look into the word together. Gracious God, we come once again seeking many things this morning. We may be seeking comfort. We may be seeking encouragement. We may be seeking hope. Whatever the need this morning, we pray that each listener would be hear the word as to provide the word that they need this day. And may we all be encouraged to be doers as well as hearers of the word. And may now the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we're on the home stretch of the journey. Doesn't it feel good to be on the home stretch of a long journey? Like that last flight uh, uh, into your home airport or the drive home. It always feels good to be on the home stretch. Last summer, Elizabeth and Sarah Lucas and I took 15 of our high schoolers to West Virginia. The drive was long enough that we broke it up into two days on the return trip. But even so, by that Sunday afternoon, everyone was sick of being in the van and maybe a little sick of being with each other. Most were napping or listening to music with headphones. There was not much talking or bantering or interaction going on that Sunday afternoon. But when we hit the sawmill, everyone woke up. We were almost home. Elizabeth and I were driving the two vans and playfully passing one another, as, which got the kids really excited, as you can imagine. At the Reader's Digest light, on the, as we're nearly home, we stopped side by side. You can imagine the jeers that were going back and forth between the vans as we revved our engines. And when the light turned green, we took off and reached the blinding speed of 45 miles an hour. <laughs> and I beat her to the Mount Kisco exit. So maybe I did 50. I, I don't know. 
After a long journey, it felt really good to be on the home stretch. And when we got to the church parking lot here, parents and siblings were waiting for us with open arms. Today we're going to look at the Apostle Paul as he was on the home stretch of his many missionary journeys. Paul was the frequent flyer of the ancient world. After he was converted on that road to Damascus, <clears throat> even his conversion took place on a journey. He went on three more missionary journeys to Greece and Macedonia and what we would call today Turkey. He writes this second letter to the church in Corinth, which is in Greece, of course, as he is making his way back to Jerusalem for the last time. After he gets back to Jerusalem, he has one more fateful journey. He is arrested and is taken to Rome to stand trial for preaching the gospel. And we believe he died under house arrest in Rome. The Apostle Paul is known for many things, of course. He planted churches all over the Mediterranean world. His writings inspire us with beautiful poetry, like 1 Corinthians 13, and deep theology, like Romans, the book of Romans. He can also make us scratch us he our heads and even make us angry with some of the things he says to women in the church. Paul has many things to the church, but there's maybe one thing you didn't know about Paul. He was a great fundraiser. While on his travels, he asked churches to send support to the mother church back in Jerusalem. There had been a famine in Palestine, and they had many widows, because as you can imagine, many people, as they retired, got older, they would want to come back to Jerusalem to spend their old age, and they would be a part of the church in Jerusalem, and they would have many widows to take care of. Paul saw fundraising not only as offering practical help, to people in need, but he realized that it could establish bonds of Christian love between people who would never meet each other in this life, but they were part of a family nonetheless. But even more than that, Paul saw giving as a spiritual exercise that can multiply God's grace and blessing in the life of the giver. I'm going to skip over a page for the sake of time. <laughs> And part of Paul's wisdom is found in the paradox of giving. Paul makes it clear that he cannot command them to give, for that is not true giving. He wants them to give because they want to, not because they have to. Being able to require people to give is tempting, but it's fool's gold. If I could make all the members of this church give 10% of their income, would that fill our coffers or empty our pews? I'm afraid it would be the latter. Not only do people not want to be forced to do anything, they certainly don't love an institution that requires that support. And the churches in some European countries are a good example of that. The churches are supported by taxes. There are times when that sounds tempting to us to think, wow, what a nice thing to have a steady stream of income from the government. But guess what? The pews are empty. And why is that? Because there is no ownership on the part of the people. And more than that, they probably resent the church for taking their hard-earned taxes, just like we all do. Everybody hates the tax collector. The church in Macedonia proves the paradox that is at work here. They saw giving as a blessing and a privilege. They found joy in giving so much so that Paul says they begged him for the privilege of sharing in the ministry of the saints in Jerusalem. Begged him to give. Begged him to share. Can you imagine? We have many generous people here in our church, but I don't think I've ever seen anyone beg me to give money to the church. Maybe it's because I know I'm such a pushover. I'll let almost anyone, actually I'll let anyone give money to the church and share in that joy. And here's the beauty of it. There really is joy in giving. Thinking about these Macedonian Christians begging to share in the joy of giving reminded me of some of my mission trips. I've been in some very poor communities in places like Mexico and Honduras and Cuba. And even the Philippines. I was on the island of Cebu where much of that 
recent damage has taken place. Some of these wonderful people I met had absolutely nothing that you could point to in this world, and yet they wanted to give us gifts. They wanted to share, of course, their wonderful food and even more. And at first I resisted. They couldn't afford that. I didn't want my presence to cost them money. I came to help them. I didn't want them to have to take care of me. But then our hosts told us something very important. They told us to let them give. They wanted to give. Perhaps it was a matter of pride. Perhaps it was cultural. But let me tell you, there was joy on their faces as they were able to give back to those who had come to help them. On one of my first trips to a town called Ruiz, Mexico, I met one of the local pastors, Mario. On the day we were leaving, he told me he wanted me to come and see his house and meet his family. It was a tiny structure on a muddy road on the outskirts of this little town. But he was so proud of his home and his family. And before he left, he told me he had a gift for me. He ran back into the house and he brought me this bag. Beautiful handcrafted bag that the men in that part of Mexico carry around as uh, their man purse, if you will. Put things in it as they went through the day. It was such a beautiful gift and I'd seen them in the shops. They were at least 20 to 40 dollars, perhaps a week's wages. I thought of resisting until I saw the joy on his face that he could give me something of value. We parted by saying, you pray for me and I'll pray for you. He gave out of his poverty and in that moment we were both rich. Paul lifts up this paradox of giving out of poverty with the example of the Macedonians. Listen to these words that Jim read for us once again. We want you to know about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches in Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. On one level, that doesn't even make sense. Just think about these things that are juxtaposed, severe affliction and abundant joy extreme poverty and a wealth of generosity those things just don't go together or do they i love that bizarre but beautiful image that paul gives us of abundant joy and extreme poverty overflowing we think of joy overflowing as something good but extreme poverty overflowing that's just crazy talk but the key is in this last phrase, overflowed in a wealth of generosity. That's where they were rich, in generosity. They were poor in things, but through the act of generosity, they knew the joy of sharing, and they experienced the grace of God. And here's another paradox. Finding grace and joy in the midst of affliction is not a sign of God's absence. It is a sign of God's presence. Think about that for a moment. Finding grace and joy in the midst of poverty and suffering is not a sign of God ab God's absence, but rather a sign of God's presence. But all this talk of joy in the midst of poverty must not be twisted into suggesting that we should just let poverty and suffering continue. After all, those people find so much joy in their poverty. That's absurd. Rather, we should take inspiration to find where our poverty lies. What do we lack? Where do we need to experience joy in our lives? Where do we need to let in the grace of God? And the answer is the same as it was for the Macedonians. It's in, we find it in generosity. We find wealth and, and we find joy and we find grace in generosity. So what's it going to be, PCMK? Are we going to experience the joy of generosity? Are we going to discover the wealth that comes with sharing what we have, even if we don't feel at times that we have enough to share? I, for one, want to experience that kind of joy. How about you?
This would be a good place for another amen, don't you think? Do I hear an amen? <laughs> so friends, here's the challenge. Meeting our budget should be just the beginning. We should be giving away to other ministries a growing percentage of our income as a church. Just as we ask you to consider percentage giving as a church, we are already giving at least a tithe. Through our various social justice projects and our support of the Presbytery, we give at least 10% of our income, but we can do more. We should be begging to give others out of all that we have been given. I find great joy in the giving that we already do, but I'm selfish. I want to experience even more joy, more giving, don't you? Well, we're on the home stretch. We're on the home stretch of our stewardship campaign, and we all breathe a sigh of relief. Next week, we'll turn our attention to Thanksgiving, and then it will be Advent. But the end of stewardship is really just the beginning, isn't it? As we begin another church year, it is my prayer that we move forward with joy and with grace and wealth, and then may we overflow with generosity. Amen.